Bonjour tout le monde, I'm Diane, the American blogger behind the Living Abroad lifestyle site, We in France. Check that out if you get a minute. Um, but here on this channel, we talk about everyday French life and beyond. And this is part two of my very first Q&A. The first part is down below in the description box. So check that out and we'll get right into part two. Okay, do you find French drivers different from US drivers? Um, yes and no. I think there are, there are some things about French drivers that I kind of laugh at and I'm like, what the heck, you know? Like, um, I feel like French, French cars in general are smaller. So like you find French people kind of parallel parking, sometimes even backwards into tiny little spaces. Um, most cars here are manual as well so that's something that's a little different in terms of the actual driving like are americans more aggressive or are french more aggressive it's too hard to say you know there's people the u.s is a huge country so i can't say if i think the french are worse or better i will say that the driving instruction here is a little bit more intense than in the u.s um it's not just a simple test there's a, a road test and then a written test but they're quite intense and the driving age here is 18 so it's not like in the US where some states maybe have um, permits at 16 license at 17 it's 18 nationwide the question of driving is interesting because Tom had an idea to uh, maybe do a video showing everyone what it's like driving in France some things to be aware of what it looks like on the road and just some specific differences so to put your tourist mind at ease if you ever come and want to rent a car let me know if you'd like that video because we'll do it um Next, I thought this one was so funny. How well do the French observe line etiquette? And I'm laughing because I feel like there is no line etiquette. This is just a cultural difference. It's something I personally find infuriating, but again, it's just one of those little annoyances. I just laugh at it at this point. I'm like, are you serious? So what I mean is this will happen at the pharmacy. So at my pharmacy, it's a big one. So there might be five cashiers at the counter and people will just kind of show up and there's big aisles in between, right? So if you're in line for one, the big aisle blocks your head. You can't look over here and see who's on the other side. So there'll be five, ca five cashiers and you go up and you'll be waiting and then someone will come up next to you and kind of see that you're there and it's like the mad dash and people always cut and it, it's just, I'll be waiting there. I'll be the only one, there's no one else. And then someone will come up next to me, someone here, and then they'll walk in front of me and I'll say, excuse me, sir, I think I was here before you. And most of the time they're like, oh, okay, go ahead. But if you don't point it out, they'll just cut in front of you. Like there's no, oh, I was here first, I'll go. Another thing I find interesting, Oh, and the exception there is if someone is elderly or, you know, they're on crutches, I, I don't say anything, but I would say nine times out of 10, I speak up if I know I was there before someone else. It's just, just what I do. Something else is at the supermarket. Um, sometimes if there's a long line, you know, let's say five people in line and another register opens up just next to it. In the US, generally the next person in line, like the second person in line, would then move over to the newly opened register. And then the third one, the person at the end of the line isn't gonna go jump over to the newly opened register in the US. You do that in New York and you're gonna get screamed at, right? It's like the person who was there first has the, has the, uh, the right of way, so to speak. In France, no, no, no. It's, you know, I'll be in a line, like literally 10 people long, there's no other register, a new register opens, and people from the back of the line behind me, even if I'm literally next, they'll just run over to the new register. And I'm like, uh, hello, I think I was next, but there's, there's no line etiquette like that. Or if it is, no one's clued me in and certainly no one respects it. So French people tell me down below if you find the line etiquette efficient or maybe something that could be improved upon. Is it true that French or the, or Parisians eat dinner later at night than Americans? Um, than Americans who usually eat at six or seven. So yeah, I would say in general, again, I don't like to speak, you know, in big blanket terms because there's always gonna be exceptions. The French do eat dinner later than Americans. Um, of course, in big cities like Paris, you know, just like New York, they generally eat dinner later. Um, and I think there are a few reasons for this, but I would say it's a, a big point of contention between me and Tom. Uh, you know, I, I like to eat dinner like 7.30 and he could eat dinner at eight or nine. He goes to bed later than I do. Um, but when, you know, he gets home from work or, you know, if I was at the gym, we, we don't get home till seven or 7.30, obviously you can't eat dinner at six, you know? Um, I think families with young kids, they eat a little earlier, but if you're eating dinner at 6 p.m., especially if you're a family with like, 
kids that are at least 10 years old. If you're eating dinner at six, people would be like, huh, because that's kind of the time people would eat dinner, uh, maybe in a senior citizen's home. Um, so yes, in general, French people do eat dinner later than Americans. And I just know growing up in the US, we would have dinner, especially in the winter. We would eat dinner at like 6 p.m. because I had school activities after. I would have um, religious classes that we called CCD. I'm not religious now, but I did go to them as a kid up through eighth grade. Um, there might be some type of piano lesson or just some other activity, study group, something that we had to do after dinner. Um, I think also because stores are open, people run errands after dinner in the US. In France, maybe after dinner, you just kind of hang out at home, finish your schoolwork, watch TV, and then head to bed. So I don't know, there are probably a bunch of reasons for why the French eat dinner later, um, but yeah. Next up, what does your husband think about you blogging about France and his culture? I love this one too, thank you. Um, so Tom actually recorded something. He doesn't have social media chooses not to be on camera, but I'll play his recording in a second. I will say the French are a little more subdued in their emotions. He's not the kind of guy that's going to be like, oh my God, that was amazing and go jump on a table out of excitement. You know, he's a little more reserved, but he is probably my biggest supporter. Um, he's always ready to advise, re ready to answer questions. He reads my draft post or my video ideas sometimes and he'll say, oh, you know what? You could add this. How about you explain this? What about that? You know, he's always happy to give input. And for someone who's not on social media, Media. He's actually amazing at, you know, content strategy and, you know, video production and all of that. So um, I'm really thankful for that because if he was not supportive, I don't think this would be quite as fun. Um, but I'm going to play, I'm going to play his message now. Um, well, first, I guess at this point, Diane's blog and her YouTube, they feel normal to me. I'm used to it, like since she's been at it for a while. Um, the thing is, even if she didn't blog and share ideas publicly, she covers things that we would naturally talk about anyway, because it's part of like living abroad and being in a cross-cultural marriage. Um, something that still surprises me, I would say, is that some of her posts make me step, like, um, take like a step back and look at my own culture and even like discover things. I've had like never thought about before. So that's that's something I appreciate. That's cool. Uh, I must admit that in the beginning, though, when she would put like the spotlight on my culture and talk about some of the aspect of French people and life here, more critically, um, I could I mean, it could make a little make me like a little defensive because it's stuff I never really considered, you know, and as a spouse, like you can like um tend to take that as like a, like kind of like a hit to your culture, to what like defines you in a way. But it actually allowed me to sometimes reflect on my own culture and also understand that even when differences look like small details at first glance, they really play a part in how we live and interact with like each other. So like to make it short, overall, I'm like really proud of her for doing it. Like, as I really don't think, I mean, if the situation was reversed, that I would have the same courage and the same drive to, to do all of that, um, to in a way expose myself like she does and put so much effort and time to offer like um, valuable like insight to people about French culture. I really like we in France. I know it's like her, her baby and I'm impressed that she started all of that from scratch and like turned it into something that looks like really professional. So I like totally support her like in that endeavor because it's really like something that like uh, makes her happy. Like, so yeah, to sum it up like quickly, I think it's something really fun, something that like helped me like discover my own culture. And that I know that sharing like all of that makes makes her happy. So yeah, I like it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, what must-haves did you bring from the U.S.? There were a few questions kind of like this. So, what must-haves did you bring from the U.S.? What goodies and shopping do you bring back from France? Okay. I would say must-haves for me were just like little silly things, like home decor things and stuff I got at home goods or whatever that would just remind me of home. Um, maybe a few pictures, um, some wedding pictures, just silly little things that are sentimental to me that allow me to kind of have a piece of myself, my culture and my house. Um, specifically, some of the things like clothes brands. Um, I like buying my clothes in the US. I'm just familiar with the brands. Uh, I know my size. And again, it reminds me of where I'm from, just a personal preference. Um, my favorite brand is Athleta for 
again, I'm a homebody, so I like uh, athleisure and um, they're great for fitness clothes, which I'm big on. So lots of lots of clothes. You know, when we go back to the US, Tom always brings an extra suitcase because we we take advantage of the sales in France. There are sales twice a year and they're usually not quite as good as what you'd find um, over Thanksgiving or Labor Day in the US. So uh, definitely clothes, shoes, that sort of thing. What American foods or snacks do you miss the most? Um, in the time I've been in France, I feel like, I don't know if this is a good thing, but for me it is, uh, that things have become more global and I have access to a lot of the products that maybe I couldn't find eight years ago. Um, you know, even in my local Carrefour Express, the uh, little mini mart, I find Reese's peanut butter cups sometimes. Back in 2012, that was not a thing. You couldn't find that. Um, another store I buy things from is iHerb like H-E-R-B, iHerb.com. I have no affiliation with them, but they have a lot of great products with really reasonable shipping rates as well. Play around with the weight uh, in the shopping cart. You'll see what I mean. Um, you can get a lot of great things like cashew cereal, Cheerios. And no, it's not that France doesn't have amazing cereal or that France doesn't have these things necessarily, um, but it's just a way to kind of take a comfort from home, something that maybe means something to you, like cans of pumpkin, right? It reminds me of amazing, amazing family time or uh, an amazing moment with my grandma when I was young, you know, baking pie together, things like that. So it's not that these products, um, there's no equivalent, although canned pumpkin is not something you find here at all. Um, but with other things, cereal, candy, yes, of course, France has cereal and candy, but sometimes you just kind of want a piece of home that reminds you of home, feels comforting, and, um, just has sentimental value. So yeah. Um, tips on packing and moving clothes from the US given that the closets are small in France. Yeah, my house was built in the 50s and I'm looking at it. There are no closets in my house, like no hall closets when you walk in, uh, no closets in the bedroom, nothing like that. So we have like armoires and uh, things from furniture stores to put our clothes in, dressers and whatnot. Pack light and then whatever you pack, take out half. And I'm serious, um, don't bring that dress that you wear only when you dance flamenco with your husband once a year. Don't bring those heels that you could barely walk in, but they look cool with that one skirt. Like don't even bring the skirt, you know? Um, bring things that you can mix and match, uh, that are versatile, that you can layer. And I would say use packing cubes as well. And if you have um, a garage like me where you have shelving, you can put seasonal items that you're not gonna be wearing. Um, you know, in your garage, in the packing cube uh, to swap out in your armoire because I wouldn't even show you my closet right now. I have, I've accumulated way too much. So take my advice, pack your bags, then think, hmm, am I ever gonna wear that? Do I wear that more than five, six times a year? No, take it out and then cut that list down by half. And you will accumulate things. You'll find things in France, on your trips home, you'll bring things back. But um, I love using Poshmark. I like donating to Goodwill. Um, yeah vacuum bags where you know it's like a plastic thing with a little zipper on it and then you um use a vacuum or you roll it to get the air out those are lifesavers if you don't go over the weight limit in your suitcase use like six of those jam everything in and you'll be amazed at how much you get in your suitcase okay i'm a teacher what differences do you notice with schools and students so as i mentioned i was an english teaching assistant um, for seven months in primary schools in France. And again, I don't have kids and I'm not currently a teacher in France, but overall I feel that the public school system from what I've experienced is a little bit more strict and regimented than what I've seen in the US. So what I mean by that is I feel like there's less freedom uh, with how kids learn. There's a lot of um, dictation and rote learning, like the teacher writes something on the board, the kids are expected to copy it in their notebook. There's a lot of attention to detail on penmanship, on how to write the letters, how to stay in the lines. They use pen, um, sometimes erasable pen, but I mean like actually a fountain pen, uh, ink uh, to write. And I found overall, depending on what type of student you are, how sensitive a, of a child you are. Um, a little too strict for my liking. I kind of felt bad for some of the kids who are acting out a little bit and they got yelled at by the teacher, um, sometimes in a sarcastic way. Um, and then kids who were thought of to not be quite as smart, they would kind of get like sarcastic remarks. And I, I don't know, it's just, it was my experience in, um, in a working class area of Paris. And I know that of course not all schools are gonna be strict, but in terms of creativity and different learning methods, I feel that there's more freedom in the US for kids to express themselves through things like art and extracurriculars. Um, in French high schools, I don't believe in public schools, there are 
groups like band, um, you know, art lessons um, in school, in school hours. Uh, there's not like a, a football team, a track team necessarily in high school. So there's a little less community, I feel like, um, no prom. Um, so some of those things in the US that we kind of take for granted, we're like, oh yeah, he was on the football team or she was a cheerleader. Oh yeah, they went to prom together. That doesn't exist the same way. Um, also the school day in France is a bit longer and this varies by region. Um, so it depends where you live, but school is usually uh, for younger kids, 8.30 to 4.30, and you have at least an hour and a half for lunch. And the kids can sometimes eat in the cafeteria and they get hot meals, really, really good meals, actually. Um, it's called La Cantine, and they could eat there or they're welcome to go home, but there's no 20 minute nonsense for lunch. They get a full hour and a half. Um, but yes, the school day is longer. And again, I mentioned the regions, some districts don't have school on Wednesdays so you'll see young kids like at the park on Wednesdays I didn't know what that was about when I first came here and I was like huh our kids is it a holiday uh no some schools don't go to don't have school on Wednesday um sometimes just none on Wednesday afternoon it depends but it's a thing um, another thing is the French school kids have a lot of vacations uh, they have most have about two weeks off uh, over Christmas, then again in February, then again in April. So uh, yeah, they work hard, but they also play hard. They have a lot of vacation, but I feel the French school system maybe prepares you a little bit better for the real world. Um, instead of the SAT, what they have is a much more rigorous test called the BAC, uh, baccalauréat, you can look that up. There's a bunch of differences. I covered just the surface. Okay, what level of French were you before moving to France? Did you learn the French language on your own and any tips? Okay, so I did not study French formally in college at all. Um, after a few years of working after college, I started to pick French up again, as I said at the Alliance Française, just for fun. And I believe at that time when I left to move to France, I was like a low B1, but again, I was pretty good at writing, grammar and reading, but if a French person showed up in front of me and started speaking quickly, I would have a, I would have had a lot of trouble understanding them. And then speaking to them and understanding the response, it just was not easy at all. And that, when I got here, that was probably the biggest shock. It was that I would have to have French people write stuff down because all of the words just kind of garbled together into sounds, even though if they wrote it down, I knew exactly what they were saying. Even though I didn't have a crazy, crazy, crazy heavy accent, people would understand me and I could express myself. I had so much trouble understanding what was being said to me. So um, my biggest tip is if you know you're moving to a French speaking country, make sure your focus is, yes, grammar is important, reading and writing is important. Make sure it's on comprehension. And I'll link a blog post below where I talk about this in more detail because you don't wanna kind of struggle through it for a year and a half, two years like I did, where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just not getting it. Uh, you know, and you, you feel kind of dumb. <laughs> Sometimes I still feel dumb, but um, it was just really hard. Even though I had an intermediate level of French, understanding spoken French was really tricky. So um, then when I came to France, I didn't pursue any higher learning here. Um, I've never studied French in France. So yes, I guess you could say I'm self-taught. And now um, if I had to pass any type of test, I'd need to uh, brush up on my grammar because I don't really read, write and study grammar as much anymore. My focus is on speaking. So making sure I'm understood and then being able to communicate to those around me and understand their responses to me. It's just the part that I use in daily life the most. So yeah, I'm much better now, thank goodness. But um, in the beginning, it was really, really hard understanding spoken French. Do French people correct you when you say a word or phrase incorrectly or just let it go because they can tell you're American? I would say most people can't tell I'm American. They obviously know I'm not French. Um, I've gotten uh, people think I'm Belgian. They think I'm German um, and they'll guess maybe I'm English. It's a lot closer than America. Um, but I don't have any trouble being understood. And of course I make mistakes. I make them all the time. But as long as I'm understood, no one stops to to correct me, which I understand, but at the same time, I'm completely open to it. And I'm sure I make mistakes and keep making them because I don't know they're wrong, you know, and Tom isn't there with me in daily life to like look over my shoulder and say, hey, that thing you've been saying for the last eight years, that's not right. I have no idea. So I wish people would correct me. Um, but if you think about it, the reason why they don't is, well, one, it's not their job, right? It's a, it's a chore. You don't want to put that burden on them. Also people, uh, they don't know if you're open to it 
right? Someone could flip out and go off on you. Um, and then sometimes people just aren't used to doing that, you know? They, you have a conversation with someone, they're perfectly understood. Okay, maybe they used the wrong article or they messed up the grammar, but you understand the sentence, you know? Like imagine, I don't know, imagine you're, you're in New York City and you approach someone in the park to pet their dog and you ask what kind of dog it is. I don't know, I'm using an example from my life and they start talking to you and instead of saying like, I don't know, he, he goes to the store yesterday and they should have said went. Like you understand what they mean, right? So you're not gonna say, oh, actually it's went. He went to the store. You said goes, that's wrong. Like you're gonna look like a big jackass. You know, you're not gonna say that to someone you don't know. You just seem like a pretentious a-hole. So I just think, you know, when I make mistakes, if people understand me, which is 99% of the time, they get what I'm trying to say. Even if I try something complicated, butcher the grammar, they know what I'm trying to say. They're not gonna correct me. Exceptions to that is someone I know a little bit more, uh, someone I know a little more, a uh, little more well, well. Exceptions to that would be people I know well. They know I wanna be corrected. I've told them that and they're okay with doing it. Other exceptions is if I phrase my sentence in a way where I pause and then kind of ask for help. You know, so you're talking and you're like, Uh, en fait, uh, je sais pas si c'est, uh, you know, you kind of, you stop and you, you, you pause to kind of let them help you. Um, then of course, when you kind of give someone the option to jump in, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And I'm like, hello, I'm looking for a little help here. Can you help me out? And they don't even realize, you know, that you're, you're looking for a little help to finish your sentence, which is a little weird. But, um, but yeah, most French people don't correct me because I'm able to express myself and get out what I need in pretty much every situation. Is it always 100% correct with the proper grammar and all of that? No, no, of course not. But, um, but if you're able to express yourself, that's already, uh, you're already ahead of the game. And I will link the post below where I talk about why uh, natives don't correct your mistakes. And um, if you want them to, there's just some posts that I'll link below. Okay, are there any French accents you have difficulty understanding? Um, I would say countryside, Quebec accents, Canadian accents, um, they could be a little tricky because there's different vocabulary and um, the intonation's a little different. So I would say people from rural Canada are tricky, but in terms of people in France, I would say there's some accents that I find with older people, um, like well over 70, maybe from the north of France, that's just a little tricky to understand. Like it, the sound, and this is gonna, I don't know if you'll, if you've ever heard this, but it's kind of, you know, they say something and there's just a lot of, like, I don't know, like they're swirling something around in their mouth and it's hard for me to like, to focus in on the sound. Okay, so other than some accents from the north of France, if you go to the south of France, um, you know, an accent maybe, I'm used to it now, but around uh, Perpignan, where I've traveled for work a bit, um, I feel like they put a G in words sometimes, and if you're not used to it, it'll throw you off. Like, um, for example, bread is pain, but, and for the record, comb, you know, comb your hair is pain. And sometimes in the south of France, around Perpignan, they're actually talking about bread, pain, but they say pain. So they're not exactly saying pain, like a comb, but they're not saying pain either. It's like ping. Or instead of matin, matin is morning. They, it, it, to me, it sounds like there's a G. It's more like matin. Um, let's see, what's another one? Okay, so when I was getting my hair done, they ask if you want a conditioning treatment called a swan. But down in Perpignan, it's more like swang, swang. And the first time I heard that, I was like, pardon, excuse yeah, but now I know. And the other thing, little kids sometimes, you know, they're still learning the proper grammar and pronunciation, and it's hard to understand kids even in your native language. So it's not an accent, but I do find kids challenging as well. Okay, and the last one is, what is my favorite French word? What French words do I like? And there are some that are just hilarious for Americans to say. Um, they just sound funny and um, they flex your French R muscle. So words like a uh, squirrel is écureuil. Um, hardware store is quincaillerie, really fun. Uh, electric kettle is a bouilloir. And surgeon is always fun, chirurgien. Um, so those are good, but just for the fun of saying it, voila is really useful. It's just really versatile. I love saying voila, voila, voila. And uh, impec, short for impeccable. Um, it's just a, a way to answer like, how are you? Instead of saying good or great, you could say, oh, impec uh, for short, short for impeccable, impeccable. So 
Thanks so much for watching everyone. That wraps up the questions of part two. Again, if you missed part one, head down below in the comments and check out that link so you catch all the other questions. Anything that I didn't cover, feel free to leave them down below and I'll, I'll take a look for next time. But hit subscribe if you're into this content, give me a thumbs up and I will see you next time right back here on We in France. Salut. Thank you.